All right, next up we have Unikernel Apocalypse by Spencer Michaels and Jeff DeLeo. Please give them a warm welcome. Hi, I'm Jeff and this is Spencer. Uh, we work for NCC Group, uh, we're doing consul uh, consulting um, and we're here to talk about some intern research that Spencer was doing last summer um, under my sort of auspices. Um, basically, we First and foremost, I'd like to mention that all vulnerabilities we're going to be discussing in this talk um, were disclosed uh, prior last year, and some of them have been fixed and some haven't um, for various reasons. Uh, but we defined vulnerability here to be an issue that it may itself be exploited or um, any failing of any security protection or mechanism that was intended to be there. So what are, what are unikernels? Um, unikernels are these specialized applications that bundle all of their application code and resources into a single binary that runs as a bare metal VM where the entire application stack runs in kernel space. And what could go wrong? Um, they're intended as an alternative to sort of full VMs and, and Linux containers. Um, and so they, the thing above them is the hypervisor where in containers the thing above them is the kernel and then maybe a hypervisor on top of that. Um, they have, uh, they re-implement a lot of the components, so they tend to have their own network stacks written potentially from scratch in a different language uh, than one might be accustomed to. And they're very specialized, and sometimes you can port code to them easily and sometimes you can't. So why look at them? Uh, basically, they're a very new technology, and uh, they might, you know, I don't think they're going to completely replace containers or anything like that, but they definitely will probably find a niche that they fit well in. and. They're being looked seriously at by people to make things like Cubes OS more secure. And anything that people are doing to make Cubes more secure is definitely worth looking at, um, especially since some of the security claims from the people writing these things are really kind of don't make sense and don't add up. Uh, and then there was this blog post by uh, Brian Cantrell from Sun originally, uh, who wrote a blog post basically saying that unikernels were unfit for production because they were impossible to debug. That last part was very prescient, as we'll, we'll find out. So there are a lot of uh, claimed security advantages to unikernels. Um, things like there's no unnecessary code that, you know, if it's not used, it's, it's not compiled in because they link the whole thing together. Uh, there's no shell, so if somehow an attacker got remote code execution, they wouldn't just be able to do bin sh and they'd be just out of luck. Uh, you know, they can't, they're not reconfigurable, they're completely immutable. If you want to change anything about them running, uh, you have to just rebuild the whole thing and reload it and that there are no syscalls, only function calls, so, so therefore attackers need to know the memory layout to do anything. So all of these are basically completely false on their head. The unnecessary code thing, uh, even if they were talking about dead code optimizations, uh, that's not really true in general, and there are a whole bunch of unikernels that add in a whole bunch of modules of code that may or may not be used by the application code that sit there. The shell doesn't matter. Uh, binary level, you know, you can, you can use, write shell code for things if you get a buffer overflow. If not, if you're in a higher level unikernel, say running Node.js, and you get like an eval, I'm fine running JavaScript if I need to, you know. So I'll do that instead of binsh. Uh, the reconfiguration stuff, we'll find out that unikernels are very, very not immutable. And some of them even take like YAML configs on the fly or take binary uploads and just hot load them. So that's just not true. Um, and the syscalls thing, it's, that's just, it just doesn't mean any, it's just not even wrong. Um, so our hypothesis, is that unikernels may, in fact, reduce attack surface by throwing out a lot of, you know, the, the garbage system D. Um, but, you know, there's, that, that alone doesn't make things more secure. Um, the rest of it has to actually be secure, too. So once someone gets in, though, there's, like, no process isolation. Like, you don't need root. You are the kernel. You can, you can send, uh, you can craft arbitrary packets, do disk I.O., speak PCI to whatever godforsaken floppy disk is emulated and given to your VM. You know, things like that. So uh, back when we were doing this, uh, we started out looking at the low-level stuff with the intention to, to go higher and look at all of the re-implemented application stacks, like networking stacks and things like that. And we just kept finding things in the lower-level parts. So, so that's primarily what this talk is about. So things like, uh, do these unikernels do address-based layout randomization, which is a protection against code reuse attacks? So which memory regions and sections have randomized base addresses? Do they have page protections, things like DEP or NX that you might be familiar with? So if the pages are read, write, execute, that's probably bad. Um, whether or not relocation read-only or rel-row applies, in many cases it doesn't. 
um, which is a protection on dynamic linking so that the sort of tables of function calls that you're, you're dynamically linking, once they're loaded, they're not going to be then writable as function pointers for, as an exploit primitive. Uh, whether or not there are guard pages between the sections, so those are gonna mean that you have a page or a section between your sections that is not read, write, execute at all, and such like a continuous buffer overflow that goes straight into it would hit a page fault trap and the whole thing would die without letting the exploitation continue. And then things like the null page being mapped. So uh, with the null page, it's a bit different in the unikernel world. In the normal world where people think of kernels and user space, uh, those attacks are about uh, attacking the kernel from user space by doing shenanigans with the null page. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. So in the unikernels, um, if someone writes Linux style malloc code and therefore doesn't check null because VM overcommit never uh, causes it to never return null, it always returns essentially a valid pointer, and when you run out of memory, the OM killer just kills your process, so they, they never check null. But in, in embedded sort of systems and things like unikernels, it can return null. But null may very well be a valid, writable, readable address. And so if no one's checking null when malloc returns and multiple things use allocations from malloc that return null, they're now sharing the same section of memory and it's essentially use after free. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, stack canaries, are they used? Are they gonna be initialized correctly? Are they gonna be filled with proper random data? Heap hardening, is there pointer validation? Is there good entropy for it? Um, are the allocations randomized? The canaries, are they good? Um, it, where does the entropy come from? Is it good entropy? Is the RNG itself cryptographically secure? Um, is there any reuse of things in deterministic ways that are going to be bad across multiple VMs on the same hypervisor? Um, and standard library hardening, things like your percent %n format specifier. Uh, custom format specifiers for format strings may lead to insecure implementations in the libc itself where there's like write a section of writable memory that just contains nothing but function pointers or even potentially code and whether or not they support or even use Fortify source. So our first target um, was Rump Run. It is an interesting research target and a fairly well-known unikernel in that circle, and it's based on NetBSD's Rump kernels, which were designed back in the day so that when you were writing your kernel drivers and they crashed, they didn't just take out your system because there weren't really VMs at the time that were in use. So what they would do is they had a, very spe uh, they had a bunch of if defs all throughout the NetBSD kernel code base, and they still do that allow you to essentially take the entire kernel of NetBSD and link it against some kernel driver code or application level code and run it in uh, user space as a standard binary. So when that thing crashes, your whole system doesn't go with it. Um, Rump Run flipped this on its head, took all that magic linking and ifdef magic, and then threw it back into kernel space to run POSIX applications in, in you know, kernel space. Um, our next target was include us. Um, it wasn't originally our next target, but while we were doing this, a blog post came out claiming that they were the most secure thing ever, and it was written in C++, and those two things didn't necessarily add up, so we decided that we would look at it. Um, and then Mirage OS, um, fairly well known in the circle, and anyone who uses cubes, um, is an, a unikernel that is primarily used for writing OCaml, so that you can write uh, secure services in OCaml since it's type safe and memory safe uh, for the most part, but it also has a CFFI, and some of those components are written in low-level code, so they need to be secure as well. So we looked at how that was being protected. And then the, the next target that we have, which is actually next on the list, and we haven't gotten to it yet, is OSV, which is a unikernel uh, focused on high performance, but also other interesting things like being able to run the entire JVM in ring zero. So you can have your vulnerable Java enterprise web applications running in kernel space, you can have XSS in kernel space, SQL injection kernel space, the world is your oyster. Um, and so we're gonna be looking at that soon enough. Um, so I'll hand it over to Spencer. Okay, so let's get into the gory details, and gory indeed they are. So uh, we'll start with Rump Run, which is a 64-bit unikernel. Uh, it runs on KVM and Zen as well as bare metal. We tested on Zen because that's mostly where people are running this. So Rump Run has a, a POSIX interface with the exception of threads and a few other small things. So basically you can run most POSIX compliant apps with very little modification, sometimes none. It supports all these languages. Uh, interestingly, it also comes with a separate repository of a bunch of packages like Apache and Nginx that uh, w basically just build on, out of the box on Rump Run. They've done the tweaks already, but these look sort of like POCs. It doesn't seem like they're updated. Uh, I'll get to that in a bit. 
Um, basically, the way Rumprun is constructed is, as Jeff said, it's just like the, the NetBSD kernel, and they strap that on top of Zen Mini OS, which is an operating system that uh, it's very minimal. It basically just does everything by making calls to the hypervisor. So if you want to make a power virtualized guest on Zen, your best bet is usually to just build it on top of Mini OS. So Rumprun doesn't have any ASLR. Uh, it's saved a little bit by LD, which we've taken here to calling the poor man's ASLR. Uh, basically, what that means is if you're linking in slightly different code, or like if you know you make a function slightly longer, it's going to push stuff down, or LD is going to put stuff in different places. So like if you don't know the underlying code of a binary, then you don't know exactly where everything is. But you can often make a reasonably decent guess. Um, and if you know the code, of course, it's it's all deterministic. Um, what's interesting, too, is because this is running as a paravirtualized guest, Zen maps the hypercall page into the uh, ver very early on in the memory space. So it turns out you may even be able to use that to do ROP, but it seems like there may not be enough primitives. We just found that recently, and we're not actually sure of the full impact. It doesn't really have any extra page protections. Uh, the tech, tech section is not writable, but data stack and heap are all RWX. There's a little bit of protection in that the null page is not RW or X, but there are also no guard pages, so you know you can just say stack overflow into the heap or something like that. Um, there are stack canaries only in a very sort of edge case if you happen to get lucky. So the core make files of Rumprun actually disable it, so like Rumprun itself is never going to have um, stack canaries. If your compiler happens to turn them on by default in your application code, that's built separately and then linked in. So your application code might have it. Um, now, the random canary value is generated at runtime properly using the BSD syscontrol crypto APIs. But it turns out that because Rumprun doesn't have thread support, they didn't implement thread local storage, of course. And uh, GCC expects the canary to be stored in and retrieved from thread local storage. So it turns out that the canary, even though it's generated correctly, it turns out to be null in practice. It, it's just eight null bytes. On the other hand, if you have up to eight stir copies, it will save you from that. But anything else, you're on your own. Um, the heap protections are pretty negligible. The allocations are deterministic and contiguous, and there's no pointer validation of any kind. There are canaries in the heap and page chunks, but they are A, compiler defines, and B, they're not even positioned correctly in, in, in the one case where, where it actually has a null byte in that define. So essentially, they're completely useless if you want to exploit them. Uh, Jeff will talk about the entropy situation. Stairs, Stairs right? Stairs. So um, rump run and uh, the rump kernels have an interesting system where they have a whole bunch of if defs. And for some reason, when you're building uh, rump kernels, the if defs basically mean that your RD RAND, your CPU uh, RNG, is disabled, even though that's not a privileged instruction. They co totally could have run that as a user space binary. Um, so rump kernels, uh, rump run, using the same if defs, suffers from the same flaw. It basically has no CPU, in our, our, uh, CPU RNG. So it completely falls back to the VM uptime and CPU cycle count which are so deterministic in how this thing starts up that essentially at start every time you are getting the same exact random values out of dev u random, which is spooky. Um, it's saved a little bit by the fact that NetBSD is sort of complicated and has all sorts of other entropy sources. So anything that you print f, which I'm not sure why you would do on a unikernel running on AWS, but if you print f something, that output will feed into the entropy system. MAC headers from packets that the system sees uh, will get added in, although those are probably going to be you know, pretty much the same values back and forth on a, sub, on a given subnet between the, the unikernel host and the gateway. Um, and then the host uptime, which is also known to all guests on the same hypervisor. The RNG itself is this sort of weird SHA-1 thing that actually has a whole bunch of code, uh, co uh, code comments saying that it hasn't actually been like, audited or anything. So that's, we haven't looked at that. Um, but this is all accessed through the standard NetBSD ways of doing it, so the BSD syscontrol syscalls, and uh, also the virtual file system uh, sets up dev random and dev random correctly for all of this. Okay, so the standard library is implemented with BSD from, or sorry, with libc from NetBSD. Um, and that supports percent and doesn't support custom format specifiers. Uh, it does support Fortify source, and actually the NetBSD like core make files will turn that on to the highest level. But then the top level rump run make files will turn that off again for debug builds. And it turns out if you use the like rump run build tool chain and scripts, it will always give you debug builds, and there's no flag to disable that. It just sort of does that silently. So if, you, if the average person is building rump run, this is going to be the case.
It also has syscalls almost. So they're not triggered by an interrupt, but there's a function called rump syscall, which you, I mean, basically acts just like the regular syscall function, arguments and all. And the first 24 bytes of it, when, when we looked at it in all the rump run unikernels we generated, are unique. So you can scan for this very trivially as soon as you get RCE and then just fire off as many syscalls as you want. Um, in addition to that, to get initial RCE, the syscall table is a really good target because it is populated dynamically on startup and then it's left in a writable state. In addition to this, rump run, basically the build tool chain takes a sort of image config that tells it what libraries to link into your final unikernel. And the default is about twice as many modules as we could get it to build with. So when they're talking about like reduced attack surface, they don't emphasize that you need to prune this config down. So Rump Run's heap implementation is, is kind of interesting. They have a, basically, it's, it, there are two major primitives, which is a memalloc chunk and a page chunk. And the memalloc chunk basically represents the chunk of memory you get back when you actually malloc something. And that, the two important fields here are align pad and magic. Magic is the canary, and you'll notice above it, unprotected, is align pad. And what that does basically, it's the amount you have to subtract from the base pointer to the memalloc chunk to get up to the page chunk above it. And the page chunk has a level, uh, which is just like a metadata you can very easily guess, and magic, which is a canary, but it's four bytes that are not null, so you can, uh, and it's in a compiler defined, so it basically doesn't exist. Uh, and then next and previous, you can use that to perform the classic unlink bug. Um, there's a lot of details about this if you're interested to look at the slides, but we're not gonna reiterate like all of Malik Maleficarum here, because it's basically just classic unlink. So if you want to exploit the rump run heap, basically what you have to do is get an overflow in a heap chunk onto another heap chunk that'll later be freed. And you just need to overwrite the first eight bytes, the MH align pad field, such that when, it's, uh, when that value is subtracted from the base pointer of that chunk that you're now corrupting, it uh, points back to a fake page chunk in your uh, overflow buffer that you've written out. And make sure level and magic check out, that's really easy. And then just set the next and the previous pointers however you want to do a write. Um, there is a caveat, of course, with this kind of exploit that the value that you're writing must itself be a writable address, otherwise it's going to cause a crash on the second write. Um, although you may want that, actually, as we'll show in a little bit. So basically, uh, rump run security situation is not good. There's no ASLR. Everything but uh, text and null page are RWX. The canary situation, generally speaking, they're not going to be any, and if there are, they're pretty useless. The heap is not really protected. There are canaries, but they don't do anything in practice. The entropy situation is also weak, and particularly if you're attacking from another hypervisor guest. And while the standard library supports hardening, it's explicitly disabled. And you may be thinking, well, here. Um, heap overflows basically in rump run, they will give you RCE under pretty much any circumstance, especially if the attacker has a source code or binary but sometimes even in cases where you don't because you could attempt to brute force uh, the addresses you need. Because while they are not, uh, you won't necessarily know where they are, they're not random. You basically, like if you know roughly what's, what's in a rump run image, you can guess pretty well where they are. And by the way, rump run is also completely unmaintained as of just a little before we started researching it last summer. Um, basically right now they only update it every few months to like add compiler flags to disable new GCC defaults that would make it more secure but actually break the old rump run code. So that's interesting. And at this point, you may be thinking, well, what could possibly be worse than what I've just said? And to this include us says, hold my beer. So, Include us is a 64-bit unikernel that, unlike Rump Run, is pretty specialized. It's exclusively for C++ uh, services, particularly web services. Um, it runs on KVM and VirtualBox and VMware, but it's primarily developed for and tested on Linux KVM. Uh, now, it's worth noting here, before I go into saying all I'm going to, that Include OS, the version we looked at, is from summer of 2017. So uh, they have likely fixed some of the stuff we're talking about. Given that it's actually maintained, it's probably more secure than Rump Run at this point, but we haven't actually gone back to check. But before I talk about what I found in Rump Run, let me explain a little bit about how I actually found it, because it turns out that debugging in Include OS is like really, really, really difficult. Um, in fact, I suspect that the Include OS developers probably have not ever tested Include OS running as a unikernel, be or rather debugged Include OS running as a unikernel, because it turns out the boot script they use to do that doesn't even have a flag to enable the GDB debug bridge. It's trivial to add, but the fact that it wasn't in there is kind of suspicious. Uh, if you compile binaries with debug symbols and then actually run them as Include OS unikernels, 
they'll just crash on startup most of the time. And we figured out a way around this, which is like if you run the non-symboled version and then attach GDB and then load symbols from the symboled version, it actually doesn't work either most of the time. Uh, generally, it'll die with a CRC mismatch error, and we don't even want to speculate what, what causes this. If you manage to get past this, which again just happens sort of randomly, uh, breakpoints also don't really work. You usually have to just start the guest paused and then like insert jump zero instructions and then manually put the original bytes back when you're ready to continue. It's not good. So. Having gone all through this rigmarole, we find that include us, basically the ASLR situation is exactly the same as rump run, but what makes this more embarrassing for them is that in that uh, include, include us is secure blog post, um, the CEO mentioned that include us, quote, randomizes address at each build, and it seems like he's just confusing the linker, like normal linker behavior with compile time ASLR, which include us definitely doesn't have. Um, he also says that include us is immutable. It's, it's not. It's like the most mutable anything can possibly be because every single page of include us is RWX. So you can, I mean, literally, we actually, we didn't have a full POC for this, but we got far enough to realize that you could probably like inject your own TCP IP stack and then like load a new include us image on top, like into an existing include us and then start running that. It's pretty terrible. Uh, as you can probably expect, there are no additional page protections either. Uh, there are no guard pages, and even the null page is mapped RWX. You get the use after free sort of thing that Jeff was mentioning. The stack canaries, they're certainly more prevalent than in, in, in rump run, but that's not particularly helpful. So they use F, protector, uh, F stack protector strong uh, in the core kernel and also the like application pre preamble CMake files. So everything's going to have stack canaries, but the canary values are compiler defines that are generated randomly by the like CMake random string function which is really low entropy, not cryptographically secure, and that CMake list that builds it is in like the core of include os, so only when you rebuild include os, the main image itself, does the canary get regenerated. So all of the uh, images you build against one build of include os are gonna have the same canary and it'll p persist across restarts, so actually you can just brute force it pretty easily, especially given how fast it restarts after crashing. And by the way, the thread local storage bug from Rump Run pretty much appears verbatim here, so just ignore everything I said, the canaries are actually null. Uh, the heap doesn't have any protection at all. It contiguous allocations, deterministic, no canaries, no pointer validation, nothing. Uh, so the entropy system is actually one one thing that uh, include us uh, did fairly well. So it just uses RDRAN for for everything. Um, it does uh, some CPU feature detection uh, to detect if it, if it has it. If not, it falls back to cycle counts. But modern CPUs is not going to be a problem. Um, the the R, actual RNG applied on top is uh, basically they took the internal sponge function out of uh, Ketchak, uh, which is fine, that works. Um, uh, but to access the RNG, uh, they actually, the way you just open up dev random or dev random, and uh, right at the beginning of their open implementation, they actually just stir, co uh, stir compare every single like, string path that's passed in and just literally just check if it's dev random or dev random, and then they return you a magic file descriptor that goes to the, uh, the RNG. The interesting thing about this is that in the middle of when we were looking at, they updated it a little bit because it used to be at uh, the, the magic file descriptor was number 998, but they never actually checked if when they were incrementing file descriptors elsewhere, when they were returning new ones, whether or not that collided with the magic one. And so if you opened up enough files, eventually one of them would just be dev random and not your file that you intended to use, but they, they later fixed that. Um, oh, yeah. So the standard library from, uh, that they're using for the C, uh, C standard library is Red Hat's Newlib, which was designed for embedded systems and has basically no security whatsoever, as much like other, other things that they provide. So it's got percent %n, no custom format specifiers, probably just because of spacing, complexity constraints, and embedded environments, and has no support whatsoever for Fortify source. All right, so I'd like to bring your attention to this point. The very first sentence of this include us post says that it was written with security in mind. We'll let you decide. So uh, probably the most egregious thing that the include us uh, project did was they decided to throw out all, all sort of knowledge about how memory is supposed to be laid out for applications and kernels and things like that. And so in the include us world, the stack is in low memory followed immediately by the text section, followed by data, followed by heap in high memory. And so if you, if you see anything odd about this, uh, you remember that when you have a, a buffer, you write to increasing addresses. And so what this means is that if we have a buffer overflow, 
we can actually just continue past the end of the stack right into the text section, start overwriting the code, and if you're really lucky, the, um, the actual uh, copy loop that maybe it's, it's uh, you know, mem copy, stir copy, some for loop, you know, that's gonna be early on and, sh and short enough so that your buffer overflow will be enough to actually hit it. And so when you overflow the actual, you know, move instruction that's implementing, that's performing the buffer overflow, you don't wanna use a op because, uh, you know, much like your, your buffer writes, uh, code executes uh, down, but it, it increments the, the IP um, address. So basically you actually wanna use jumps that go backwards in a chain until you go all the way back to the start and then run your shell code going forward. And as our demo shows, if you're not that lucky, well, you're still pretty good because include us, the way that it links code together, it puts basically all user application code right at the beginning of the text section. So even if you can't get, you know, memcopy, when memcopy returns, it's just gonna return right in your shell code and it's never even gonna, your, and ideally your shell code doesn't check the stack connector, uh, st uh, stack canary. Just don't do that. Uh, where's the, uh, other way the other way around? Uh, this one? Uh, stack overflow. Yeah, so we have a demo that basically we just break on uh, memcopy um, and then on the end of it, we have to run through a couple of them because they're used in the up bring, uh, bring up of include us. And then we just start stepping it and you can see us uh, stepping through our reverse jump chain or as we like to call it, extreme not, sl not sledding, uh, until we get to the very start of it with the final jump and have our actual shell code that's a little bit complicated. Uh, it, it prints out, you know, hello Torcon XX. The only reason this is complicated is because I, I wrote it so that it doesn't have any null bytes in it. Um, I'll hand it over to Spencer. Okay, so as Jeff said, the uh, include us, all the low level stuff is implemented with new lib. Um, this is about as insecure as it sounds. It is basically just vanilla unlink. Again, if you want to know about this, either con like consult Malik Maleficarum. It, it applies verbatim. So basically, with an unlink, because of chunk coalescing, in free, if you corrupt a chunk, you can, you can write one to three pointers anywhere you want. So how do you chain this to RC? It turns out that include os has a panic handler called onPanic, which is just a function pointer that if it's non-zero, it'll get called when the OS crashes, like, say, on a page fault. Um, you can overwrite this. Now, of course, if you want to jump back into your, your code in heap overflow, the heap, in fact, it's actually really deterministic. You might know where it is, but for the sake of argument, let's suppose you don't know. What you can do is, since you're corrupting a chunk, you can induce a crash inside free, and of course, at that point, the pointer to the uh, chunk that's corrupted is gonna be on the stack. So what you can do is use the first write via unlink to point the panic, overwrite the panic handler and then point it at some, any known writable location, which is everywhere because it's in include us. Um, it also needs to be executable, actually. Uh, and then use the second write to write eight bytes of shellcode to that location. And what the shellcode needs to do is just increment RSP up until it's pointing at the um, address of that buffer on the stack and then it calls ret. And then that just returns into your buffer. And that's great, but there's one more problem, which is that the, again, new lib is made for embedded devices, so it's trying to save space. And the way that the malloc chunks work is that they're part of a linked list, of course, when they're free, so they have forward and back pointers. When they're allocated, they don't need them. So the buffer starts from where the forward pointer is. So because this, uh, the chunk that gets, that, that gets passed to free, that gets unlinked first, forward and back at that point need to be pointers to valid writable addresses, otherwise you're gonna crash too early. But then you return back into it, and you return right to forward. And so forward and back actually also need to be valid shell code. And the, the eight bytes of shell code we have doesn't have enough space to actually increment anywhere beyond that. So we thought this was gonna be really hard, maybe impossible, until we looked at the first instruction in, in the include us binary we were looking at, and it appears to be an eight byte knob that also happens to be a writable address. So thanks, Clang. Uh, we have a demo for this as well, whoops. So here we have a vulnerable TCP server with a, with a buffer overflow on the heap, um, and we assume we don't know the size of the buffer overflow, so basically what I'm doing here is a sort of exponential backup, where I'm just sending bigger and bigger buffers, seeing where it crashes, and you see it restarts really fast, so it's great for brute forcing. Um, and basically we are finding the distance to the next heap chunk header, so we know how to corrupt it, and then we're going to use that to just write to progressively greater address, uh, addresses, incrementing just by like one pointer length each, each time, and in just a moment, it's going to, whoops, it's going to find the um, panic handler, and there it's printed our address, or sorry, our message. 
So include us. Uh, there basically aren't any protections, with the exception of like really half-hearted canaries. Uh, the ASLR, the, there's no ASLR. Everything's RWX. Canaries are constant across reboots, not cryptographically random, and also they're null all the time. Uh, the heap has no protections at all. The entropy is actually OK, except for the NSA case. And uh, the standard library doesn't really have any hardening at all. So basically, include us, like, it, it doesn't have any security features. Like, if you get any kind of memory corruption or, like, even just look at it the wrong way, it's, you're going to get RCE. Now, on a better note, we have Mirage OS, which is an OCaml-based unikernel. And what, what drew our interest to it is basically it's intended to be used probably in Cubes OS to create these secure minimal attack surface VMs. And in that case, it'd be running on Zen, so it supports both KVM and Zen, but we, we tested it on Zen just because that seems the most interesting for this uh, use case. And because it runs OCaml, it also supports uh, FFI, so you can, you can call native code from the OCaml. And basically, the way that it's constructed is pretty much like Rump Run. You take the OCaml runtime and you put it on top of Zen Mini OS. Although they have their own fork, which has just a little bit of differences. So you might be wondering, why would you use OCaml? Because it's like sort of an obscure functional language. Uh, basically, the argument comes down to the fact that it supports like also object-oriented programming and imperative pretty decently. But it's also reasonably memory safe. Uh, not as much as something like Rust, but it, if you're doing just like regular OCaml things, it's, it's, you're going to be fine. You're not going to run into like a buffer overflow or anything. Although it turns out that vanilla OCaml does have support for some operations that are distinctly not memory safe. Um, but if you're writing normal OCaml, you'll be fine, right? Well, no, not exactly. Um, OCaml has some pretty bad CVEs, and you know this one we're pointing to with the arrow is, is a 10. That actually is not applicable to Unikernel because it uses environment variables. But the top one is a memory corruption that absolutely would be useful to us, although we haven't done a POC. There's also a spooky library called Marshall, which is for deserialization. And if you basically like specify the wrong type, quote, anything can happen at runtime. The only limit is yourself. Welcome to Zamboka. Yes. Um, so much like Include Us, we were having quite a bit of trouble debugging Mirage uh, because right now Mirage only supports running as a para-virtualized guest on Zen. And it turns out that there are no deb good debuggers for Zen para-virtualized guests. And by no good debuggers, I mean literally there are no debuggers for para-virtualized guests on Zen. Uh, there's VMI debug, which is really nice. It's, it's modern. It's libvmi based. It it's, you know, supports lots of nice, nice things. Unfortunately, none of the things we are looking at. It only runs uh, with Linux and, and Windows HVM guests. And Mirage, obviously, is not uh, Linux or Windows or HVM. There's also GDBSX, which comes packaged with uh, Zen. And it's like a GDB server, basically. But it, 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 it goes downhill very quickly. Like, if you look into the code base, you realize it's using these GDBSX branded syscalls specifically implemented in Zen for GDBSX. And it seems like after a while, I realized this is probably because the Zen developers documented their VMI and debugging APIs so badly that, like, they couldn't find them later. And so they just said, oh, screw it, we'll implement the syscalls specifically for this. Um, it can also only do peak poke. So it also supports reading registers theoretically, but it doesn't speak the GDB remote protocol well enough to talk to either GDB or LLDB when it sends registers. So basically, eventually, I realized that um, using these is a nightmare, and it's actually easier just to go and write my own debugger. So I did. Um, I call it Zen Debug, and Jeff calls it Zen Bag, and I kind of don't like that, but it's stuck. Um, it uses this time the correct Zen debugging and VMI APIs, which I had to basically hunt down myself and dissect the implementation because, like, wow, good luck if you're like even you're looking for like the comment at the top of the header file that tells you what it does. No, those are like not there most of the time. Uh, it right now it has its own REPL, which works pretty nicely. But even more functional is the GDB server. It uh, it's, it's like a, it's a stub GDB server, and by GDB server, I mean LLDB server, because it turns out that GDB doesn't actually speak its own remote protocol to spec, and uh, I'm not going to deal with that, honestly. So right now, Zendebug supports para-virtualized guests, and it can read and write registers in memory and do breakpoints and stepping. And right now, we're trying to work on getting memory region info so you can like read the page tables, but it turns out that Zen actually doesn't have an API for this in para-virtualized guests, so it's going to take a little while. So I've got a demo of this as well. Whoops. And right now on the bottom right, we've got a simple Mirage OS unikernel. It just prints, hello, I'm a test, every second 100 times. And we're going to run it in the bottom left. And then start Zendebug with, oh, with uh, port 1234 open. And it will stop the guest automatically. 
And here we see it's it's uh, this is actually the syscall page. It's stepping through instructions. It follows the ret even. And here we're going to now search memory for the string hello, and then write a magical value into that area, and then continue. And we should see it's now printing our message. Fabulous. Whoops. Okay, so Mirage OS, same ASLR is the same situation as the other two. Uh, it's basically like you know, public code yields deterministic binaries. Um, the para-virtualized page thing with Rump Run is, is also here because it's, it's running as a para-virtualized guest as well. Uh, what's interesting is that OCaml has a pretty big runtime, and of course it's all written in C at some point. So most of the OCaml runtime is going to be like deterministically ordered and placed at like a semi, not random, but like an, a location that you won't know necessarily. So uh, if you can find any part of OCaml, you probably know where the rest of it is and you may be able to do something with that. The page protections are just like rump run. Text isn't writable, but data stack and heap are all RWX. The additional page protections are actually good. They've, they've pretty much done everything that they should. Uh, they have uh, unmapped or guard pages. It's hard to tell because we can't inspect PTEs yet. Between at least the data, data and stack sections and then stack and heap. And the null page is mapped, but not RWX, so that's good. And Railro again, doesn't apply because all the linking here is static. There are no snack canaries, so unlike Rump Run and Include OS, it doesn't even try here. They're explicitly disabled uh, in the Mirage OS like core make files, and then when you use the build tool chain, it also uh, disables for your application code, even if even if your uh, like GCC turns it on by default. The heap doesn't have any protections at all, um, with the exception of a little bit of pointer validation. So uh, it's implemented with xmalloc from MiniOS, and so the allocations are deterministic and contiguous. There are no 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 sort of like heap or page chunk canaries. Uh, unlinking small chunks has pointer validation, but most code paths don't. And I I have a POC for an unlink bug, just like I showed you with uh, include us. So the entropy situation is interesting, because there are two packages you can use for entropy. They don't really specify which of them is good, and they really should, because one of them is great and one of them is terrible. Uh, the terrible one, of course, is Mirage Random, which is a wrapper for OCaml's random module, which is not even cryptographically random, but that aside, uh, the way it initializes itself is it gets a seed from devu random, but because there's no file system and it like doesn't do any special casing like rump or include us, um, opening devu random just returns one. And in fact, literally the implementation for open is just return one. Um, it will then fall back to the um, PID and PPID, so like parent PID, uh, as well as get time of day. But the first two don't exist because there are also no uh, processes on unikernels. Those are just hard coded to return two and one respectively. And so ultimately the only entropy source that it actually gets is the current time. This is obviously bad. There's also Mirage Entropy, which is good. Uh, it can do RD Rand and RD Seed, of course, only on x86. And it also has something called the Whirlwind RNG, which they refer to with a, a new research paper. And it says that it attempts to exploit CPU level data races that lead to execution time variability of identical instructions. And we're not crypto experts, but this sounds kind of spooky, spectral even. Um, we're, uh, we, we don't really have the expertise to assess this, aside from like obvious non-crypto issues, which we didn't find, but it would be interesting if, if someone with crypto expertise could take a look at this, because you might find something. There's no standard library hardening. They got their own standard library called MiniLibC, which is like a really thin wrapper around MiniOS, and it's the usual. It supports percent n, doesn't support custom format specifiers, and doesn't have any Fortify source support. Um, something interesting and rather unique to Mirage OS is that it's built, of course, on the OCaml like package infrastructure. So it uses OPAM as a package manager, and uh, rather like you use OPAM to install packages to build it. And that has a SAT solver based dependency resolution mechanism. And so what this means is it can install arbitrarily out of date packages without warning you. Um, if you have something like this diagram, you have a top level package A that depends on uh, like package C at version greater than 1.0 and then it depends also on package C transitively at say less than 1.0 via another dependency. No matter how high the version of C is currently, if you install A, it do o OPAM doesn't let you install two versions of the same package. So in order to satisfy this, it'll just install version 1.0 of package C and it'll, you know, the interface will give you exactly the same readout as if it installed the, the current version of package C. Like it'll show the version in some little thing somewhere, but unless you're really looking hard, then it's, it's not going to act any differently. It won't warn you. So you have to be really careful if you're developing any stuff uh, for Mirage OS that like you don't let OPAM screw you with really out of date packages. So right now, there are a couple other vulnerabilities, like real vulnerabilities that we found. 
but um, we can't talk about them because we just found them in the past few weeks and we're still in the dis disclosure process, but rest assured these will be in the white paper. So in short, uh, Mirage OS has no ASLR, basically no page protections on data stack and heap. Text is okay, null page is okay. Uh, there are no canaries, uh, even if you try to enable them for your application code. Um, noth nothing at all on the heap. The entropy is good as long as you're using the right package, but they don't actually specify that that's the one you should use, and the standard library doesn't have any kind of hardening. So basically, if you get a stack buffer overflow, you're great, you can get RCE pretty much immediately. Um, most types of heap buffer overflow, except some stuff with small chunks, will give you an arbitrary pointer write. Uh, again, keeping in mind that the function, point, like the function addresses that you might want to utilize are gonna be in slightly different places, but again, you can brute force those or, or scan. Um, the entropy implementations and the OCaml package manager, OPAM, you have to be pretty careful about how you use them because they can shoot you in the foot easily. So, uh, given these three assessments, I think it's pretty obvious that it is not the case that unikernels are secure, but they are rather hilariously broken. And uh, that's basically because they don't implement even simple security measures, uh, so to the point that if you get most types of memory corruption on, on the unikernels we looked at at least, they will lead you very easily to RCE. And oftentimes, as like in the include os demo, you don't even have to have seen the binary or the source of what you're attacking. So on top of this is the fact that everything has kernel level VM capabilities, so like as soon as you get any control, it's already full control. Like there's, there's no privilege separation, there's no root or anything. As soon as you get RCE, you can start crafting arbitrary packets, do PCI, whatever. Anything the VM will let you do, you can do. But with that said, uh, it's worth mentioning that even though Mirage at a low level is basically the same situation as Rump Run, it is actually still an order of magnitude more secure than any of the native code unikernels we looked at because you're not gonna be writing that much native code on Mirage. With that said, um, memory safe, language unikernels like Mirage still need to be pretty careful about how their low-level components, which are most likely gonna be written in C, are hardened. And they also need to focus on actually providing like secure APIs for application developers to use because they can't just rely on being inherently secure. They actually have to like help application developers develop secure applications. So basically, unikernels, unlike the claims of many of their proponents say, are not a cure-all. Basically, they're embedded systems running in a VM, and they have about the same level of security as you'd expect from a lot of embedded systems. So to put it lightly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done before unikernels become at all suitable for production. In retrospect, it should have been obvious as soon as we saw that there basically wasn't a debugger for the overwhelming majority of unikernels we looked at, and we actually had to write our own to assess some of the under underlying components. Um, we'd like to thank some people. Uh, first of all, uh, Mindy Preston of uh, the uh, Mirage OS project for being super helpful with uh, teaching me all sorts of stuff about how OCaml's FFI works uh, during the last CCC in Germany. And then uh, Brian Cantrell for being an epic troll who happened to be right this time. Um, <clears throat> for future work, we're gonna start looking at OSV. Uh, we have white paper, at least the first one coming out soon. It's like at 100 pages right now that are mostly diagrams and exploit shell code. Um, so that'll, that'll be cool when it drops. Um, and then we are going to be looking more for those higher level things where there are issues in the kind of stack code of when you, when you decide to re-implement your own TCP IP um, implementation, what, what can go wrong? And, and that sort of, that kind of level of stuff is uh, one, of the, one of the sorts of bugs that we already found. Uh, we weren't really looking for that kind of bug, but that's one of the ones that we, we can't talk about um, of what happens when you just re-implement all the application stack from user land to kernel to hardware and just throw it all and bring zero. So uh, we're looking for more of that. Um, if there are any questions, uh, we have a little bit of time left actually. Uh, so we actually got through this faster than, than our demo runs for ourselves. Um, uh, I'll also add that uh, uh, NCC Group is hiring. So if anyone wants to talk to us about that, uh, we'll be around. Uh, so just feel free to stop by and ask us questions. So any questions? Okay, thank you.